in a world where Microsoft virtualization is still considered to be the underdog by some. The Hyper-V Amigos enlighten the IT crowds on how they could very well be mistaken. Hey, good evening, Carsten. How are you? Hi, Didier. Greetings from Germany. I'm fantastic. I'm thrilled. We are doing another Hyper-V Amigo showcast. And uh, this time, it's about... Hyper-V backups. Ah, we, ha we have to do that because it's a very exciting uh, uh, thing to do. And uh, a lot of people out there have, have some problems with it, right? I have no clue why. <laughs> <laughs> and especially with some VMs backing up. Okay. V you actually back up VMs. Yes, we do that. But oh. uh, I mean guest clusters today. Will you talk about that a little bit so you get a little bit excited? Uh, I, I, I'll mention it. That's <laughs> okay. <sure. laughs> so let's but, start. <laughs> but, it would be, but it would be sad to waste all our time on just one tiny little subject while it is so vast and, uh, well, interesting. That's true, actually. Yeah. That's true. So, go on. I see you well, have the good, the, good, the good news is that people who are watching this are actually interested in backups. Because good. basically nobody is. Yeah. Nobody is. Until you need to restore them. <laughs> then all of a sudden everybody thinks they have them and that they will work. So, it's a good thing that you are interested before that happens. So, yeah. well yeah. done. So, normally I've, I've been very successful and I think I can say the same of uh, Carson... Uh, you, you, of course, yourself, uh, in designing nice, well-functioning, well-performing Hyper-V backup solutions. Yes. We've had our challenges. We, we, we've seen some issues. But normally, if, we, if we're involved uh, from the ground up, from the start, we do pretty well. But unfortunately, uh, not everything in the world is designed with you from the start. And sometimes things are already in place. They call that brownfield. Uh, or sometimes people have bought a lot of stuff that they think they will need and then you have to make it work with the stuff they bought and yes. it's not exactly what you would buy etc etc so you know the world even for us mvps is not perfect i know it's 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 a it's a drag but that's the way it is <laughs> it is yeah. but the reason for this is that, that i'm mentioning this is that you have to keep a holistic view of the entire backup process because it all ties in together the backup storage the backup target the network in between them the design of your csvs how you how mobile are your virtual machines uh, all that kind of uh, things come into play when you design a, a hyper-v environment but also the backup for the hyper-v environment so that's quite important uh, so and, let me ask yeah. you a question first, because you said you design it for backup. That's true. But what is more important, backup or restore? Restore. Yeah. So shouldn't you also design the environment for a smooth and fast restore? Absolutely. Because and most of the nice. people only think about backup, right? And we, we, we didn't actually agree on this, but you're a very nice man because I actually wrote two blog posts for Veeam about instant VM recovery. <laughs> and that's all about designing your backup solution in terms of doing the restores. Yeah. 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 Hey, well done, Karsten. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> we, no, but, we did. but I, I hear it so often times that the backup times or the backup window is so important. We have to back up the stuff between, let's say, 10, 10 p.m. in the evening and 4 p.m. in the morning, but nobody cares about restore unless they have to restore something, and then yeah. it takes maybe days or so. So and then, uh, then it's then then for a lot of people that's a shock to the system because yeah. even if they have complete uh, functional backups, they are shocked by the amount of time it can take them for them to get back online. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people, as you say, really don't take that into consideration. And yeah. testing is a very good way to find out how fast you can restore. But that's a, it's a very good remark. Uh, now I'm gonna I'm gonna steal some information from Microsoft here. Yeah. This is what Microsoft thinks, and they are quite correct that were or still are the challenges you might have with backing up Hyper-V. So they were a bit worried about all the agents you need to put on every host to make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, 
normally I select my backup software to be as easily managed as possible, so it's not too much of a concern to me, but it can be a drag if you have multiple backup solutions and large environments, etc. Then you have this little backup software, Requester, that invokes a, a snapshot on, on, on in the guest for each VM and on, on the host for each VM, so on the LAN. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the worst case, it's for each VM, and it could be even worse because if you have a VM with multiple disks and those disks are spread across multiple LUNs, then backing up one VM even invokes multiple LUN level host backups, right? It's, it, it, it can add up. So that, that doesn't sound too bad if you think about the example of one VM. Now think about a couple of hundred VMs spread across dozen, dozens of LUNs. Yes. It's, it's, it adds up quite quickly. Now, that snapshot on the host, that, well, it has to be mounted. The data has to be copied off somewhere to the, to the, to the backup target or the restore source, as you might call it, if you think in terms of restore, which is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the past, and I'm, and I'm talking about uh, 2008 R2, 2012, even 2012 R2, you almost needed to stand with a hardware VSS provider to do anything at scale. Now, that sounds really nice. If you have the money, you buy a good SAN with a good hardware VSS provider. And guess what happens? Hardware VSS providers aren't always that perfect as you might think they should be, right? Yeah. So that's another problem. Uh, and then there's the intelligence of the backup software. Backup software actually grew up in, a, in, a, in an era that there was no virtualization. So they were not designed for virtualization. So a lot of backup software was lagging behind in, in intelligence to make virtual machine backups uh, practical and performant and scalable. Uh, you ha they, they really didn't have any change block tracking that, as we have today. So they yeah. were copying data all over the place for actually no good reason. Uh, and then the other thing that you have, if you are relying heavily on uh, snapshots on the host, is that it really does interfere with VM mobility. And one of the nice things about VMs is that they are mobile. You can migrate them all over the place from host to host, even storage live migrate, share nothing live migrate. Those things just fly all over the place and you just have to make sure you can back them up. <laughs> and let's say those two needs uh, on classical storage don't always you know, uh, combine that well. So these are the challenges that Microsoft identified and heaven forbid, they seem to look pretty correct with what I see in real life. So, we've mentioned uh, VSS. Uh, oh, this is nice. Oh, yes. It's very nice. I, I, I also had a picture of, it's on MSDN, how, the, how VSS works. It looks yeah. like an eye chart. It's very complex. You probably would not even be able to read it on the screen, but it's quite a complex process. So we'll we'll save we'll save that. We won't show it. We'll just say it's very, very complex. But we will talk about how backups for Hyper-V worked in 2008 2008 R2 and 2012. Uh, it's important, so please bear with me. Yeah. I have three of these. The, the, the other ones are about the newer versions, but it's important to notice. Okay. So what do we have? I will try to use the mouse here. We have a backup software, the requester, that says, hey, I'm going to back up a virtual machine. So it talks to the VSS framework on the Hyper-V host. And that one is going to talk to the Hyper-V writer on the Hyper-V host. And then you have these Hyper-V integration components running inside your VM. So these two talk together. So the Hyper-V writer on the host says, hey, I need a backup. So those integration components say, no problem. I'll ask the guest to create a VSS snapshot for you so you can have an application consistent snapshot of the VM. So that's cool. So the Hyper-V writers in the guest go to work and they create a VSS uh, snapshot right in the guest. When that snapshot is ready, that integration component is going to tell the host, I'm done, you're good. And then the VSS framework knows, hey, okay, the VM is finished, right? So that's that's happy. So it's going to say, hey, I need to, uh, I need to make a backup, but hang on. I need to create a host VSS snapshot to do that consistently because one VM is one thing, 10 VMs are something else. Yeah. So it takes time. So time time progresses. So you start making a host snapshot. When the host snapshot is done, well, time has passed. So basically what's in the host snapshot versus what's in the guest snapshots isn't exactly on the same moment. It's not 
instantaneously. So what happens in these versions of Hyper-V is that the snapshot that is in the uh, host snapshot is mounted actually on the host. And it is reverted based on the snapshot in the guest mm -hmm. to that moment in time. So can you imagine that you have to mount all of them, expose all of them to the host to revert them back to what they were of each and every single VM? That takes quite a lot of time. Yeah. It is it is very time consuming. It is not very fast. Now, once that is done, the host snapshot is ready to be copied to the backup repository. If you're very lucky, in those days you had a backup software that did change block tracking. Mm -hmm. If you did not, that would mean that this backup and the data you have to copy over to the backup repository are always the full amount of data. And again, and again, and again, which meant that you would almost have to revert to deduplication software or a deduplication target, third party custom built or in, in process, post process, doesn't really matter, just to manage the enormous amount of uh, data you were storing. Let's yeah. say you have 10 terabytes of, of, of backups and you have no change block tracking and you just make basically full backups almost every time you back up, then something has to happen. And basically that's what you saw with the native uh, backup software in Windows for Hyper-V. That's what it does. And I had humongous success with uh, deduplication in Windows Server 2012 and 2012 R2. I had some small environments where I used a native backup uh, solution. And I had like 90, 96% success in deduplication, but of course I had. I was copying the same data over and over and over again yeah. of the same 10 VMs. So, but the point is this doesn't scale. This entire process here is a bottleneck. And then if you don't have change block tracking, you copy data like there is no tomorrow. And if you have 10 VMs, hey, you know, I can deal with that. But if you have 100 or 1,000 VMs, that becomes very problematic. Yeah. Microsoft knew this, and they did something about it. Yeah, well, just before you go to the next picture, can you go back, uh, Didier, please? Okay. So um, there is quite a difference between 2008, R2, and I think 2012, uh, thinking of R2. the of the hardware VSS provider that you nearly needed in 2008, R2, right? So if you had a, yeah, had a backup just, on a SAN in a cluster? Um, basically, basically, I think you still needed it in 2012 R2 as well. Yeah, but it's 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 getting better, or? Huh? It's getting better. So I have the next slide is about 2012 R2, yeah. the improvements. Yeah. It, it was a huge improvement. And then in 2016, we are almost in Walhalla. Yeah, okay. So but that's, uh, that's... I, re I remember in Zahn, uh, in, 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 in clusters, that we had to redirect that I.O. without hardware VSS providers, and then you tried to solve that with hardware VSS providers, but they were not so stable, so this was always that's a mess, another, right? That's another problem. If yeah. you were lucky, you, you had a good one, and you could use it, and you could hope that it would stay good, that it wasn't mm -hmm. upgraded and became bad, or vice versa. You could try once in a while and see if it improved. Yeah. So if you were lucky, you had a good one and it was consist consistently good, uh, but not all vendors had uh, very good uh, backup, uh, let's say, hardware VSS providers. Yeah. Uh, and, and not all the, the storage vendors, their native backup tools were also very Hyper-V aware. They weren't that smart. Yeah. So that those things are, are, yeah, they used to be a big, a, a lot more of a challenge than today, but still, still today you will see some issues with that. Okay. Uh, but of course we've said this doesn't really scale. So how do you make this scale better? Well, in 2012 R2, there was a big difference. So basically the story is exactly the same, except that we have something different now in the VM. We, if you if you run uh, VSS admin list providers inside of a Hyper-V virtual machine, in 2012 R2, you will see this little thingy in the uh, integration components, the software shadow copy provider, mm -hmm. which basically pretends that it is like 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 it's a hardware like hardware VSS provider for your VM. It emulates that, mm -hmm. and that is why when 
a backup is requested from the host, and we go through the entire process again, that the guest VSS uh, writer is making a snapshot, it will actually create uh, an AVHDX and a VHD, right? It creates a differencing, a differencing file. And the big thing is that the, at the moment when the guest VSS uh, provider is finished here, and it returns that to the host, it says, hey, the snapshot is ready. This thing said, hey, I'm going to need a reference to an AVHDX. So if you've, if you've looked at your VHD files during a backup, you would notice this weird grid AVHDX appearing mm -hmm. and after the backup disappearing. Well, the thing is, it needs a reference to a name of that file before it exists. So leveraging a grid was the way to say to the host, hey, this is the file you're going to use later when we've created it. But at the moment it needs it, it wasn't there. So hence you have this grid-like uh, file name. Now it is there. This one is going to say, hey, I'm going to create a snapshot on the hardware, but to, to make sure that when that is done, the content of my uh, hardware snapshot and the content of my snapshots in the guest between which there has expired some certain amount of time are consistent. You remember before we used to mount it into the host to revert the snapshots that we had in the guest. Now we're just going to mount the VHDX into the guest itself via a SCSI controller in the guest because in 2012 R2 you have a SCSI controller and with a SCSI controller you can hot add disks mm -hmm. and then the reverting of the content of that VHDX to uh, a consistent state is done in the guest. So that's cool. That scales a lot better. And once that is done, you can create your snapshot, you can back up it to the repository. If you're lucky, you have change block tracking. And when the process is done, everything gets cleaned up and the, the gritty HVHDX, it will just disappear. Yep. Now, the, the thing is, Sometimes it doesn't disappear, then you need to clean it up. Sometimes that happens, not too often. But this process scaled tremendously better than the previous one. Because the exposing uh, all that snapshot info to the host was very time consuming. Yeah. So this was considerably better. And the magic is, of course, this uh, software shadow copy provider in the guest and the fact that you can uh, hot add a disk to a SCSI controller in a guest. Right. This this is the big difference between anything uh, before 2012 R2 and 2012 R2. Okay. That's exactly that little thing. But it's very important. It made life a lot better. But still, you know what happens when you make things better or bigger? People tend to start doing things even bigger and e and they become even <laughs> more demanding. Okay. So. It's it's an arms race, right? You you come up with with a with a 10 gigabit network. Well, by now people are trying to push even more data through your network, and you want 25 gig. But that's that's how life goes. It's the same with backups. So you used to have a challenge backing up 100 VMs. You solve the problem. Now they want to back up 1,000 VMs, right? That's 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 how it goes. And then you run into again reliability issues, scalability issues, and performance issues, because it all takes time. Remember, if you don't have very intelligent backup software, if you have a LUN with, let's say, 20 VMs or 30 VMs, and you say, back them all up, you create the guest snapshot, you create a host snapshot, you create a guest snapshot, you create a host snapshot. That's 30 host snapshots for, for, for the entire process of backing up those 30 VMs. Yeah. That's a lot of time, right? That's a lot. So some intelligent uh, backup software try to make that better by allowing you to create multiple guest backups from a single yeah. hardware snapshot. Not all of them did that, but it existed. So that were improvements. But Microsoft were trying to improve things and, har and backup vendors were trying to improve things. But it was hard. And especially uh, this one, uh, change block tracking is a hard thing to do. It's normally kernel level, so it's yeah. also kind of risky if you don't do it right. Uh, and if you don't do it right, it blue screens. And if it blue screens, you complain to Microsoft. And Microsoft is like, it's not us. It's, 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 it's them. And 
you know, you, or it's the hardware provider, and you have to talk to the SAN vendor. And who is it now? Is it is it my backup vendor? Is it my hardware vendor? Is it Microsoft, Hyper-V? Who's to blame here? Yeah. Well, in reality, everybody in more or less, but not always at the same time in every environment, right? So take your pick. Yeah. So this is the big challenge. Uh, come 2016. What Microsoft did here is get rid of the hard dependency of a host VSS snapshot. And they did that by leveraging actually everything that uh, a VM already has. A VM can create uh, checkpoints, a VM can create differencing files. So what if we can create a new type of checkpoint that is application consistent and that we can leverage for a backup without needing that host VSS snapshot. And that's basically what they did. So one of the changes is that they they, they made it all Hyper-V WMI, which is remotely uh, accessible. So actually, there is no more need, if you want to talk to this remotely, you can, to install agents. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that many backup vendors still won't do so because they have other needs and optimizations and other functionality where they want to use it. But strictly speaking, to create a, a, a guest backup, you no longer need them. It's all remotely accessible. So then we go to the well-known process by now. Everybody talks to everybody and we create a snapshot. Right? In the VM. In the VM. It's a guest snapshot. Yeah. You create this nice little EVHDX. But this is what they call a recovery checkpoint. And a recovery checkpoint is built especially for backups and for uh, replication in Hyper-V. So you create one, and then that one uh, is used. So you have a a fork, actually. So the the active data is here, and this is your snapshot. And what you can do is, well, you can copy this off to backup repository. Change block tracking was introduced natively in Windows which means that even if your backup vendor doesn't have change block tracking, it's okay. Leverage the one that, uh, that, that Microsoft gives you. And once you're done copying the data, you just throw away the, 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 virtu- the difference in disk and you're back to normal. And in that little change block tracking, you keep track of all the points you have in time, which gives you the change block tracking, and which makes sure that if you have to copy data, you don't have to copy all of the data. We will dive into that a bit deeper later on if we have time, but that's the gist of it. The thing is, this is this works without a host VSS snapshot. Not the Windows one, not the hardware provider one. You don't need it anymore. And I cannot tell you how much better this is. Yes. If you use, if, if you, no, really, I can tell you, but it's a lot better that you do it and compare it. If, you, yeah. if you've been doing backups, you will love this yeah. because it makes things so much faster. It makes things so much better. And even if you have a stand and you have a hardware VSS provider or you integrate your backups into the SAN, which uh, is nice to do for fast backups and fast recovery, but I would always advise have another have another uh, storage array lying around with backups that are not dependent on your SAN, just in case the SAN goes that de- goes yeah, uh, yeah. goes AWOL. Uh, you can still use that, and that is also a lot faster, because all that work that work that you needed to do with mounting that uh, VHDX into the guest and reverting it to the known the well known consistent state that's gone. That consistent state is what you have in your in your recovery checkpoint. That's what yeah. you want. That's what you need. So if, even with a even if you use a hardware VSS provider to have transportable snapshots with off host proxies or to integrate it into the SAN snapshots, it is a lot faster, and it is a lot more reliable because that entire very complex, time-consuming process it's gone. Mm. So but there's also um, you have to do something with your v, uh, with your VMs, right? Uh, in 2016, uh, they have to be host on 2016, and they have to be a special VM version or uh, well, special. I would not call it special. Yeah, but the, the latest one, eight or so, yeah, right? eight. It has to be the native version of the opera, of the the Hyper V version. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So if you if you if you move VMs from from 2012 or two to 2016, they will maintain their version normally. If if you imported one, uh, they would be upgraded automatically. Yeah. Now they do not do that anymore because they want you to be able to go back 
or perform a rolling cluster upgrade, rolling cluster OS upgrade, I should say. So they don't do that automatically anymore, which means that they take away some of the risk when you move to a newer version. Think about it. If you move from 2012 to 2012 R2, and for some reason your 2012 R2 firmware of your network card said, I have a bug and I'm blue screening all the time. And you said, okay, I'll go back to 2012. Uh, you couldn't because they had upgraded the version and the way to revert was a stand snapshot or restore from backups. Mm. So upgrading was a risky process. By not automatically updating that VM version, they have taken a lot of the, the risk if things go wrong you can go back a lot easier. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, there are so some uh, vendors there, they rely now uh, in 2016 only on the on the backup process uh, by Microsoft. So the Microsoft change block tracking, let's say that. Yeah. So if you Which, don't update your version, you can't back up the VM. So. No, but no, you, you can, but you will you will be using the, the, the change block tracking that your vendor provides. Will it be installed on 2016? Uh, I don't I think, think so. so. Huh? I, 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 I can't speak for every backup vendor. Yeah, I'm thinking of so. one in particular, uh, the one that we like the most. Oh, the, oh no, I, I like a lot of vendors, of course. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Didier, this is not a Microsoft marketing thingy here. You can say what you want. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've, I've seen all kinds of issues with, with the version. Yeah. You know, uh, there, was, there was this moment, there was this moment where if you were in a rolling cluster upgrade, you could still back them up because you had 2012 machines anyway, right? 2012 yeah. or two machines in that in that area. Then you had all 2016 machine, but the, your cluster functional level was still at, at the previous yeah. level. And so depending, I, I'm not going to speak for every backup vendor, but depending on how well they could do it and what was possible, they might be able to help you out or not. Anyway, I try to move to that phase as fast as possible. The challenge I had there at the given moment is that I'm, use, I'm, I'm leveraging a hardware VSS provider for the transportable snapshots. That failed. And I had to be at VM level uh, eight to make that happen. Yeah. So having cluster functional level uh, nine, so 2016, wasn't enough. Having your cluster completely migrated to 2016 wasn't, wasn't enough. enough. I needed to upgrade to VMs as well. Yeah. Uh, but that was actually a bug that, that they fixed. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, so that bug got fixed uh, from that favorite vendor. To <laughs> okay. Uh, we will may uh, see or may not see a demo maybe later. Or? Uh, we might see a demo, yeah. <laughs> okay. But uh, this is this is the, this is uh, probably the, the the most important things we've touched upon, right? The, the change block tracking, yeah. as you mentioned, it's native, which means that it's become a lot easier for backup vendors as well to release their software for the new version of Hyper-V, 2019 that's coming. Because otherwise they had to write their change block tracking, the kernel level stuff, over again. Some never did it, some did it, but it's not easy and everybody has to write their own. Now there is one single mechanism provided by yep. Microsoft to do that same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's all based on the native capabilities of Hyper-V, right? Creating checkpoints and using those checkpoints to copy off data for safekeeping. Because if you think of it, all the functionality you need to make a backup is available in Hyper-V. Yeah, it is. Checkpointing, uh, application consistent uh, checkpointing, you have it. And what 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 is it? What is it? What is it? What is copying data from a, from a checkpoint? It's an export or an import. If you restore it, so the the concept of how to do backups is available within the the framework of the ver of the hypervisor. Yeah. It and is. that's what they are, they are leveraging. So this is this is quite cool. Uh, so, so the challenges we've talked about it: you know, failing VSS snapshots, reliability was an issue, uh, complexity of hardware VSS provider, off-host proxies, transportable snapshot. It works, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it could be quite a challenge to make it work, especially if you don't have control over the quality of what you're getting from your storage vendor. Uh, then there were issues with backup agents, it's kernel mode, possibility of blue screens, quality, change block tracking, complexity. And then you had uh, the problems with storage. You had, there used to be a time where we had a, a really nice SAN, maybe two for redundancy, and all our data was there. 
Nowadays, data goes into the cloud, data goes onto uh, a hyper-converged storage solution, some data goes to a SAN, some data goes to whatever. You, 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 you think of any storage vendor nowadays, and I see a lot of places with multiple different types of storage vendors for multiple worlds. So the world isn't as, let's say, uh, monocultural as it used to be. Uh, then all those disaggregated storages lying around, uh, you have problems with VM mobility. Even within the same stand, you had pro problems with VM mobility because if you think about change tracking, uh, change tracking is nice, but what if your what if your VM now resides on another host? Mm. Uh, okay, uh, the change block tracking. Where is that kept? Or, or 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 you move it to another cluster. Where is that kept? Or the VM, is, the host is rebooted. Where is your change block tracking information? Or it blue screens, or you have a power outage. It's gone. So that creates a lot of overhead. And then there was the guest cluster support, which wasn't there actually in uh, 2012, 2012 R2. Now it is in 2016, but it's not without challenges. Uh, let's put it that way. <laughs> That's nicely put. Other challenges <laughs> we have is scalability, right? We've talked about the number of VMs per volume. I mean, you used to have 10 perhaps, now it's 20, 30, or even more. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have 10 volumes per cluster or 20 volumes per cluster, hundreds of VMs, maybe thousands of VMs in your environment, and all those snapshots, host-based, VSS snapshots. If you have intelligent software, you can optimize it, but sometimes you couldn't. Parallel backups. How many parallel backups can you start if you're reliant on a on a on a, a VSS host snapshot? How many how many parallel snapshots can you take of a LUN at the same time? You can't. They get queued, mm. right? Uh, so if you start doing lots of backups simultaneously of lots of LUNs of lots of VMs, it it, it explodes in number of snapshots you have to take. So that the scalability was a tremendous challenge. Uh, the space overhead, if you don't have change block tracking, was exploding as well because for some reason, people keep collecting data, stuffing it inside of VMs, and they want to keep it. And heaven forbid, they want to be able to restore it. So that's growing and growing and growing. Even today, that's still growing uh, as we are moving to cloud containers, uh, serverless. The date, whatever happens with the way you get to the data, the data keeps growing. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the performance, uh, the impact of a backup on your primary storage. You, you could run into latency issues. We've all seen that. You could have latency issues on, on your uh, backup target because you need to think about that as well. Some people just think like, oh, my backup target is not that important. It's secondary storage. I'll just buy 10 of the cheapest, largest disk I can find, and then I'll back up 1,000 VMs simultaneously to that crappy storage. It's not going to work. Forget it. It's going to fall apart. So sometimes you need to invest a little money in the performance of your backup target as well. Then the duration of the backup. Uh, some people just can't meet their backup window anymore. Yeah. And while they are struggling to meet their backup window, some visionary guru from some consulting company walks in and starts blabbling about, oh, always on enterprise. You need to create backups every 15 minutes. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, how are we going to do that? We can't even back up all our VMs at night. It doesn't work. Yeah, so what, what, are, what are you talking about? That kind of challenges. And again, of course, the more data you need to copy, uh, it's bad for performance because that impact you are creating on your performance of your fabrics, whether it's storage or network, is lasting longer and longer. And almost in some environments, it's it's permanently. You're you're permanently backing up, so you permanently have this impact on your on your environment. Yeah. So change block tracking is something that Microsoft finally uh, introduced, and I was very happy to hear it when they did it. And I actually had uh, only one one requirement for them. Do it well. Because there is a little competing hypervisor that has had quite a number of bugs in their implementation of change block tracking. <laughs> and that was only noticeable if you tried to restore something. Which was kind of annoying because, you know, how many people do not test their restores a lot. regularly? A so lot. they would never know that they had an issue until you really, really needed one. And then it's too late, basically. Uh, 
So that was my only requirement to them was do it perfect. And they had some issues in the beginning, but they fixed them quite, quite quickly. So that's the good news. So what they got rid of is they uh, were critical to efficient, efficient backups, right? For space, network, traffic. They were critical for backups without SANS. If you do not have a SAN with snapshots integrated where you could mitigate some of that data copy actions that you needed to do or use off-host proxies so you didn't have to copy it over the network. So this helps tremendously in those environments. And guess what? What is such an environment? S2D. There is no hardware VSS provider for S2D. There are no transportable snapshots. It relies on this. That's right? true. That's, yeah, that's true. Of course, that's true. I wouldn't lie. So every <laughs> vendor has to implement, used to have to implement their own, which slowed them down uh, supporting newer versions. So Microsoft took care of that for them. Uh, it was installed on every host in the I.O. part, which was kind of risky. Microsoft didn't like that too much. Uh, every U.S. release, we've mentioned this, retesting, recertification, code changes. And then the, the, the VM mobility and the power failure scenario, how do you deal with that? And Microsoft solved this as well. And uh, there's a little hint here in the screenshot. This is a virtual disk. It's actually of a guest cluster, which is kind of cool. The MRT file and the RCT file uh, are two different files for two different use types. And we'll look at them uh, soon. So let's let's take a look here what that, what that actually means. Because that's something you will see the moment you create the first backup of a virtual machine on 2016, you'll see those two files appear. So what, what, what are they? What, 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 what do they mean? Well, the RCT is the uh, resilient change tracking, which is actually quite granular. So that's small pieces of data. And that's, that's, that's the, the, the green zone here. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the modifiable region table, but it's, it's less, it's more, it's, uh, it's, it's more coarse. It's less granular. So it's more, it's bigger blocks of data, but it's right true. So if writes are cached and you lose power or your host blue screens, it isn't persistent. So you've lost that data. So normally with, with uh, change block tracking that only, only does this, this is quite performance because it's cached. But when you have blue screen, hey, you can lose the data. Or you have a power loss, you can you lose the data. And this is nice, but the problem is, well, how do you how do you protect against uh, a power loss or whatever? Well, you use write through, which means that it's persisted always, it's not cached. The problem is this has a big performance impact. To reduce the performance impact, it is a lot less granular. It's a lot more bigger blocks of data. So as long as things go well and you do normal backups and you do live migrations, you have VM mobility that is like say normal, then the RCT file is used and you can restore uh, or you know what has been backup and what needs to be backup on a very small scale. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, quest, just a question. Yeah. Uh, can you explain the numbers? Maybe they are not clear. Okay. Uh, so what you do there? So I, I, I think you in in uh, insert something like yeah, what yeah, a great yeah, block, yeah. and then you insert. Yeah. Something. So working hard in IT is my block. So that's the data that's there. Yeah. And then during during let's say phase one, we are writing what a great block. Mm -hmm. So and you see in memory we have all these small bits once, yeah. of data, the ones in, in phase one, and that is put into the RCT change block tracking uh, via write back caching. Mm -hmm. right? That's what's happening. Now, that's all pretty cool. And then it's also put into the modified region tracking, but in larger segments, larger blocks of data. Mm -hmm. A bit later, we write something else. That is... That's the red, that's phase two. That's the second thing that gets rid of. Yeah. And again, it is put into the change block tracking in the write back, via the write back cache in the RCT file and in write through in the MRT file. But it's a bigger block, which means if you live migrate, this is the granularity of change block tracking. Oops, uh, of change block tracking I have. The green uh, if one, I the RCT, right? The RCT, yes, this yeah. is the granularity. So if I create a backup now, it knows perfectly Look, this is the data I have already backed up. This is what this is what he knows. Yeah. If, however, 
uh, there's a power outage or there's a blue screen. If you don't have uh, change block tracking, then what what, you, what what are you supposed to do? You, you have to create a new complete full backup yeah. or you have to take the existing file and do some checkpointing uh, and, and, and comparison, you know, check something to see, hey, uh, what's the difference here? So what, what did I what what did I lose? What yeah. what what is it? What information? That I don't know? What information did I lose? You mean? Yeah, so yeah. that's checksum. That takes a lot of time. Yeah. So what what uh, Hyper-V in 2016 does is it uses the the modified modifiable region tracking because that's not cached. It's right through, so it is persistent. Yeah. And that's how you can avoid having to back up the entire virtual machine again or to have to do checksumming. You just know, hey, I lost more data. But this is my last well-known point, yeah. so this is what I need to yeah. to copy over from my backup. So it is the granularity difference. And if you if you played with 2016 in the in the technical previews, it used to be just one file, the RCT one. And all of a sudden, I remember there were two. I was like, what what happened? Where where does this come from? <laughs> and then somebody at Microsoft was trying to explain that to us. But there was a time where this that where there was only one file, but they noticed that if they wanted to cover every scenario, even the blue screens and the power loss, yeah, they, they had to dif differentiate between two mechanisms to make mm -hmm. that happen. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's what these two files are doing. So normal, quick, or live migrations, you will always use the RCT file. But during power failure, blue screens, this is the the level of let's say granularity you have and it's a lot coarser than it is normally yeah but still it beats doing a complete full backup of course or having to do check something to find out what amount of data you need to back up and, and copy over basically that's it so, so you have uh, in essence you have three levels of um where the change blocks are um are stored uh, first yeah. on the host and the memory it's very yep. granular, so you really yep. can can a small change is only backed up if if the VM doesn't move. Then, if you live migrate it to another host, uh, the, the backup is a little bit larger because in the in the RCT file, and if you have a power loss or a blue screen or whatever with your host, you still have some information there in the MRT file uh, well, that you don't have to back up the whole yeah. file again. And correct. I assume then the, so, the memory thingy stars again. The, well, yeah. the memory thingy, of course, it's it it the data is always a memory. But if yeah. you move it, even if you live migrate it, it will not be the memory for, of of the VM is there, but not of the host. Yeah. So yeah. whatever you do, you don't have the memory data, right? Yeah. Just just to make that very clear, okay. you can't use the memory data for for a backup. It's it's always one of these two. Could be an improvement in further uh, going on with uh, with the change block tracking or so on. I don't know if if memory. Yeah, we, did, we didn't hear uh, we didn't hear anything about about it in 2019, but it could be right if it's important. If it's important and if it's possible, I could imagine they they might be able to do something like that. On the other hand, of course, uh, it's memory, right? Yeah. Now there's things like persistent memory. Uh, <laughs> Maybe maybe they can find ways to speed things up, and maybe then do, you don't need to do this memory thingy. You can just use uh, better storage to persist it. You know, speed it up. I don't, I don't know. It's now it's written to the to the virtual machine uh, storage, right? And the faster that storage is, the faster that process will be. If yep. there's if there's room for optimization, I'm not the low level uh, hardcore system developer. Maybe maybe not. You're not. No, I'm not. I, I I have hobbies, but they don't involve writing kernel code for some reason. Uh, so, to give you an idea about uh, what it looks like if you do uh, a backup with a 2016 Hyper-V server, uh, most people will know that we now have standard and production checkpoints. The standard checkpoints is what you have always known. Right? But now you have production checkpoints, which are vastly improved because now they are actually supported in production. Yeah. Basically, it's an application-consistent checkpoint, which is cool. It behaves even even if you start a, a VM that from a, from a checkpoint. If you apply one, it's turned off because it acts like a backup. But standard checkpoints and production checkpoints are the ones you, as a Hyper-V administrator, get to play with. Right. Those you can manipulate. Yeah. Then there is something like a recovery checkpoint, which is actually quite similar like a production checkpoint, but you don't get to create them yourself. It's 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 reserved for backups, uh, restores, and replication. 
So they are machine created, let's put it that mm -hmm. way. And they exist in different levels, application consistent, file consistent, crash consistent. This is this is something you'll know from backup vendors. This These are most certainly the options they give you when you create backups. What kind of consistency do you want? And depending on your needs, you will select one. And uh, then the reference points uh, is, is something uh, new because it, it helps with change block tracking and creating more efficient incremental backups. We'll, I've stolen some slides from Microsoft to help explain that. But if you look at backup software, what you can see now, it's creating VM recovery checkpoint, right? That's what it's doing. It, it wouldn't say that in the past, that v VM recovery checkpoint, that is new. Mm -hmm. like that's something you will only see on 2016. Uh, there we go. Uh, import and export functionality. Yeah, we, we've, we've said that, okay, now they, 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 they base their backups on the native capabilities of, uh, of, of, uh, of the hypervisor to create checkpoints that are application consistent. Well, you can export files and you can put them on your backup target, which means that, hey, uh, I can manage with my change block tracking uh, what data has changed. So I only need to copy the change. And for that, they actually create a differencing file to keep the amount of data you need to copy to the backup target as small as possible. Yeah. And then they have the virtual machine ID management, uh, which is uh, they have virtual machine IDs that are maintained for import. This is important because you want to make sure that if you restore a VM and you overwrite the old one, it doesn't get a new idea. So all your management software, your backup software, it all just keeps working. Yeah. So all, and it's all based on native Hyper-V capabilities, which is the cool thing, which makes life a lot easier for backup vendors. And then there's something that they call virtual machine groups, which is basically something you need to uh, backup guest clusters. And that's where things can get kind of interesting. <laughs> okay. I actually I actually tried to do a backup just before this webcast with the latest April uh, cumulative update. Uh, let's <laughs> say I will I not. Tried. Yeah. I will <laughs> not be demonstrating the feature tonight. Let's put it up. <laughs> I'm still having some. Uh, Maybe some in challenges. May. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, uh, we were talking about that RCT and MRT, and I've already shown you what it looks like uh, on the normal conditions after the first backup. You have this two, these you two change two. tracking files, right? But during a backup, you will see that there are differencing files generated for all of them. Mm -hmm. For the real disk, but also for the change tracking, for, for the change tracking files. And this is a cluster node, so you see multiple disks, right? You have the OS disk, the data disk. So this is what what you see happening, and this will all, this should all be cleaned up uh, normally, but sometimes it doesn't work that well. So that's <laughs> one of the challenges we're dealing with. Uh, but basically, this is normal. So a lot of people are a bit confused when they when they don't really look under the hood a lot of a Hyper-V host, and they want 2016. What are all these files, and what are they used for? So hence this webcast, right? To, without going too much in detail, try to explain this. So this is basically, I stole this bluntly from uh, Taylor Brown, who used to be the uh, PM responsible for backup. Now he's moved on to containers. <laughs> so we can't annoy him with our questions about backups anymore, yeah. which is kind of a shame. Uh, but then, okay, let's say we have a VM, it's running. This is your production storage, and this is your recovery storage. This is really nice thinking. They don't call it a backup target. They call it recovery storage. I like it. <laughs> so what happens? You create your checkpoint, right? So at that moment, the new the new writes are going to your e, uh, differencing file, and you have an application consistent checkpoint. Yeah. What do you need to do to make a backup? Well, copy that file over to your backup storage. It's very easy. Okay. Then what happens is you have this copy as a reference ID in your change tracking. Hey, you keep track of the changes. So then, let's say, there's production, things keep going, you create a new backup. Same thing happens. It gets copied over. 
as efficiently as possible because they create a differentiating VHD X file for that. So you have to copy the least amount of data. They can do that because they know what the, thanks to the change block tracking, what that amount of data is they need. Yeah. And then when that is done, again, the, the reference point remains, but the differencing disk disappears. It's cleaned up. Once you don't need it, the data is copied over here. You don't need it anymore. It's just an ordinary VM with change block tracking. And so it goes. And your backup vendors can integrate with this process. Uh, they, they, they can leverage this mechanism to do backups, to do incremental backups with the differencing uh, VAGXs. They can use this to create, uh, uh, how shall I call it, uh, uh, synthetic full backups. Mm -hmm. That's also something Microsoft uh, deals with at a hypervisor level, but a, backup, a lot of backup, backup vendors have a mechanism to create uh, synthetic fulls on, on the backup storage. So what do you need to do that? You have to be able to delete reference points you no longer need. So if you, if you create a synthetic full, some reference, references points are no longer needed and you can throw them away. So it's all integrated and the backup vendors just have to hook into it. It's, it's kind of a nice, nice way of doing things. Uh, there's only one rule. Microsoft should never mess, mess this up. Otherwise, the entire backup industry has a problem. Normally, it used to be like vendor A had a problem. Okay, everybody else is happy. Now, if this goes wrong, well, the entire industry has a problem. So yeah. there's a kind of a, of a responsibility or burden for quality on the shoulders of Microsoft. Now, these guys are building Azure cloud scale things. So I'm like, they're probably pretty good at what they do. They're not perfect, but they're probably pretty good at what they do. Then there's a restore. The most important thing is about backups, actually, right? Mm, yeah. So how does that work? Well, you have your backups. OK, these are now two, two uh, full synthetics or two full backups, but they could be differencing ones. Uh, you just create a VHD, or you have a VHD you can copy to production. You also have your uh, configuration file backed up. You restore your configuration file of the point in time that you want. You bring that virtual machine online, you preserve your virtual machine ID unless you want to make a copy or whatever, and that's it. You're back, you're back in business. Mm -hmm. This process fully integrates with your SAN if you want to, uh, in, in multiple ways. It, it, it integrates with your SAN with off-host proxy. With off-host proxy, you just create a host snapshot that only makes a copy of all those uh, differencing files and those VGXs. You mount them on another server where they are copied to the backup storage. But other than that, it's exactly the same as mm -hmm. the mechanism we described. If you want to integrate your backups with the snapshots on the SAN itself, that also still works. There's only one big difference. While you create your checkpoint, on the SAN you get the AVGX and the base VHD. Mm -hmm. This one is in the snapshot that you take on the SAN. And the only thing you need to safeguard is actually the, the configuration file. Because, yeah, the, the, the snapshot, the data that you want to keep, you don't need to copy it off because you're keeping in a snapshot on the SAN. So that makes them very fast and very efficient. And it's with that mechanism on 2016 that you can start doing backups every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, depending on your needs. Mm-hmm. Right, so you, you you use those backups to to have very small uh, reco uh, recovery points, a very a very fast restores, and you might do other backups for long term, whatever. But or just to make sure that when the sand dies, you still have another type of backup. Yeah. But this is this is what gives you the the frequency of backups at a, at scale. So every every time somebody is running into scalability and reliability issues with with, with Hyper V. My first question is, are you on 2016? Mm -hmm. Second question is, are you going to 2016? The third question is, why not? You've just given me the best possible use case to go to 2016. That's your backups, yeah. Backups. Yeah. If only for that reason, backups. And I mean it. It's, 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 a, it's a milestone. It's an evolutionary step. It's like the dinos have gone, and look, we now have more evolved species running around, like right? Birds, <laughs> something like that. 
<laughs> and then, of course, Restore with Sand is also very fast and easy. As I said, you just mount your, you, you have your snapshot, you grab your data out of, out of your snapshot, you have your exported VM configuration. Ta da! Nice. nice. Basically, that's that's it. Uh, and I, I think I think that's my black screen, which means I should stop talking now and let you say something. <laughs> <laughs> no, you or do some demos potentially. Yeah, you you explained it very well. But uh, we do showcase, so if you have some demos, Didier, it would be nice well, to see, see something I, in action, right? Let me see what I can do for you. Let me see what I can do for you. Okay, so Carson, let's look at some demos. We've been talking all the time. Yeah. Which is quite interesting, but it's a bit boring perhaps for some people. They want to see something, some yeah. action. So and now, uh, to be honest, for people who watch the date and the time, may recognize that this recording is a little bit later than the first part, right, Didier? Yes, I, I explicitly had to forward the <laughs> clock in my lap to <laughs> pretend that we are working very hard on these videos, <laughs> and it's one and a half week later. <laughs> yeah, we, we had some uh, little issues with the last video, so the last demo video, so we decided to do it again, and hopefully today it will be much better, right? So go I on, my so. friend. <laughs> so we're going to show you a couple of the, the backup options we have been talking about, yeah. and the first one we're going to do is a combination of two things you can do with backups is we're gonna uh, back up some VMs that are running on a two node uh, 2016 cluster it's called the demo lab cluster very convenient mm -hmm. and we're gonna back up I think uh, DDA test 1 and DDA test 2 which are apparently test VMs so we can do this without any issue mm -hmm. uh, this is going to use all the native capabilities Windows Server 2016 Hyper-V brought us in regards to uh, backing up uh, virtual machines. So it has all the built-in improvements that make it a lot more reliable, scalable, and faster. And uh, instead of sending it to uh, a repository server with direct attack disks, uh, we're going to send it to an SMB tree share. That SMB tree share can be high available or non high available. Uh, if you make it high available, it can be a general purpose uh, SMB tree share or it can be a continuously available SMB tree share with uh, uh, transparent failover like in SOFS. It, mm -hmm. it depends on you what you want to do with it. Uh, but SOFS is supported for backups. It's not mm -hmm. supported for end user, let's say knowledge worker data, but it is supported for backups. Uh, I must say, I don't have, I don't really have a preference. If you would use a, an S2D as a backup target, it would be softs because general purpose is not supported on it. But if it's another type of... Unfortunately, it is unfortunately, not supported. That's yes. a very important. Uh, uh, if you want to do a general purpose, high available file server, you can't do it in S2D at hardware. You, you have, have to virtualize to them. Yeah, you have to virtualize them, and then we have to use a special kind of backup software. Um, you can't use the host backup very well. Um, well, uh, the host backup is still a bit problematic, but yeah. look, I have this uh, Veeam agent for Windows, yeah, which that's... does a fit. It's, it says physical, but basically you can also run this inside of a VM. Yeah, exactly. So you have to use that and do a, a backup of the virtual machine with an agent installed and in, yeah. in our scenario it would be the veeam agent for uh, for windows right yeah so we're going to start off with this one because this is going to uh, show you a bit thanks to the feedback the the backup software gives us uh, that the things we've been talking about like uh, the recovery checkpoints that they are being created etc mm -hmm. and we the cluster isn't that interesting in this scenario but this one is because over here in the status and in the checkpoints we can see things about these vms so we'll be keeping an eye on them right mm -hmm. so without further ado let's kick this one off it will take a little bit of time, right? Yes. But let's make it a bit big, bigger. Let's go. So, oh, look at me. So it's three and four in this backup. Yeah. It's looking for the resources. It's found them. It's queuing them for processing, which is great. And hello, Matthew John. <laughs> he's, in, he's in Redmond. So... <laughs> Yeah, we use Sorry. Skype to do the uh, video recording of, of ourselves and yeah. the audio, so sometimes they pop something up. <laughs> yeah, so now he is uh, assigning the interaction proxy for the guest. 
right? And so that's where we are at in the process. That seems to have succeeded. He's inventorying the guest system. I'm happy. He's subscribing to some components. Ha! Oh, that he, just see created, he just created the checkpoint. Yeah. And if you look at the Veeam console, you will see it's that special new recovery checkpoint. Just available for backups and Hyper-V replica, right? Mm -hmm. It succeeded for boot already. So now what it should be doing is it mount, uh, taking the disks from that checkpoint and starting to copy the data over. So initializing the storage. As you can see, the recovery checkpoint still exists. The thing about this recovery checkpoint, it's like a production checkpoint in a way that it is application consistent, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like a standard snapshot that you knew until 2012 R2, where it was the saved state. No, this is completely VSS integrated. Exactly. That's the important part. Uh, your virtual machine, the VSS providers are triggered there and you get a consistent backup uh, depending on your yeah. uh, workload, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So basically what Veeam is doing right now is it's doing all the magic, of course, that Veeam is very well known of, uh, for, but it, it's leveraging all the native capabilities of uh, Windows Server 2016. Mm -hmm. This is something you would not see with a, with a, with a 2012 R2 uh, cluster or VM. So it's truncating so, the transi transition logs. Yeah. Do you have something in there where you have to truncate it? Okay. No, but it's it's enabled by default. So okay. it, will always, it will always try and look what, what do I need to do here, what do I need to clean up. So normally that shouldn't take too long. Yeah. And as you can see, the source was the, the, yeah. the biggest yeah. bottleneck. There, and there you have to uh, elaborate a little bit because this is great in Veeam. You see where... Um, the, where your performance is coming from, or your how you say where where, what's the problem if it's not fast enough, right? Yeah, well, not not, not it's this problem is this is, is not the right word. Uh, yeah, no, it's not at the, at the moment. It's not a problem. Yeah. I mean, it's a lab, so for some reason, it's not all flash on the on the on the storage. It's not all flash on the backup target, and it's not a hundred gigs. So I know it's it isn't as fast as it could be, but <laughs> Uh, if let's say that you have a problem and your backups are taking quite long, Veeam gives you this uh, overview of where it is spending its time, mm -hmm. right? So uh, over here, the target has no issues. The networks, well, it's about 20% that, that, that it's uh, uh, being leveraged. The proxy, well, that's... Nothing. That's not much. And yeah. the source. So what was the biggest effort it needed to do here was create checkpoints, read the data. That's... That seems like a lot, but there is very little data to copy. Uh, the checkpoints went very fast. I mean, the entire process of setting up the, the backup, uh, creating the checkpoint, getting the storage ready, copying off the data, moving it to the, the target, all the entire process, well, basically, yeah, that, I mean, two minutes and 28 seconds, it doesn't get much better. Right? I mean, just the overhead of setting up the process and, and checking that everything went okay and closing it down takes about mm -hmm. uh, one and a half minutes to two minutes probably. So, so yeah. basically, this, this was very fast. You also have these uh, timers here for every step to give you an idea. Sometimes you might say, hey, why did it hang here for 10 minutes? So you could check if there was a, an issue there somewhere. But overall... Of course, this is a small demo. This doesn't yeah. do much. The yeah, important thing that you had to see here was the checkpoint being created and yeah. cleaned up. Yeah. And, of course, the fact that over here you saw that Veeam was creating a recovery checkpoint. Yeah. What I like about uh, the Veeam uh, visualization of the process is here that you see uh, your data has a 100 gigabyte disk, I assume, processed. Uh, uh, Something it's 50, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, it were two machines with uh, 50 yeah, two gigabytes. Machines, yeah. uh, he, the change block tracking um, recognized 380 megabytes of change in yeah. the two machines, right? Yeah, and correct. And then you have the transfer. Um, we have deduplication and it's compression. Compressed. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it only uh, transferred of these 380 megabytes only 112 megabytes. So we have a. Yeah. Let's say a compression rate of 3.4 uh, factors. 3 yeah, and, that, and that, that's the entire thing we were talking about in the past. Yeah. Uh, not every backup vendor had change block tracking. Veeam already had their own implementation, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, some other vendors did as well, uh, but the, but some of them didn't, which meant that if you had uh, 
uh, a backup and you didn't know, look, what was already backed up, you had to do an entire uh, full backup again or calculate the hashes to see what was already backed up and not, which takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So for scalability, having change block tracking, for scalability, having the ability to compress data before you send it over the wire is all very important. Yeah. And that is part of the speed. So it's not just the speed of creating the checkpoint uh, and copying data as fast as possible. So disk speed on the target and the, and, the, and the source or the bandwidth of the network. It's also about, hey, what if you only need to send a smaller percentage of the entire volume of data that that there is there over yeah. the wire. That's pure profit, right? It's pure, yeah. Yeah. pure uh, optimization. Uh, and even and even it's it's of course an optimal situation. It's two VMs that are basically doing absolutely nothing, <laughs> <laughs> and it's and the full backup has already run. So this is uh, that that's by the way why the processing rate is so slow. It never has time to actually get up to speed because there is almost no data to back up. Yeah. Otherwise, you, see, you, you would see that go up. Uh, what's also interesting, and we'll look at that uh, for the next demo, I would say, uh, if we go to our volumes, and I think it's one and two we're going to back up, uh, looking at this one. We've talked about this during yeah. uh, the theoretical part, that we have a VHDX and that we have two change track, uh, three, two files here the modifiable region table, which is the more coarser level of uh, change block tracking that will help you not lose all that information even during a, a power outage or a blue screen. Mm -hmm. And this is the resilient change tracking file, which is a lot more granular. But of course, it is in, in, uh, in, in it uses write caching. Otherwise, it would be too demanding, too taxing on the on the uh, performance of the system, yeah. uh, which means that if the system blue screens or you, if you lose power, this isn't usable. You've lost the information because it's not it, might accurate, be, right? it might be in cache still, right? Might yeah. might yeah. not have been persisted yet. This is right true, so it will always be there. So this helps you during live migrations, that sort of uh, mobility, uh, and this helps you during, let's say, the less uh, planned downtime you might now and then have in a data center, mm -hmm. and it all helps. Uh, what you will see is that during a, a backup, AVHDXs will be created for both the disk, but also for the change tracking files. So mm -hmm. we'll we'll uh, we'll take a look at that when we do the next demo. Now the next demo is something to demonstrate. Now we all love storage spaces direct, hyperconverged or not hyperconverged, but uh, not everybody uses it, and there are still use cases for other types of storage. I think. Uh, not that you shouldn't consider using something else than a SAN, but if you use a SAN and you have uh, the abilities a SAN has, uh, it can be very beneficial. Uh, many backup vendors will integrate with a SAN to make uh, backups to the snapshot and keep that snapshot around on the SAN. Or you can, what I'm doing here, use an off-host proxy, just create a, a hardware VSS provider snapshot of the LUN and move that to the, the repository and copy the data from there. So you don't have to copy anything from the host to the backup target. It, yeah. It's actually a LUN that is presented on the on the backup target already. So that those are optimizations you have available in the SAN, and why not use them if you have them, right? So we're going to demonstrate this because. Now you hit your mute button again, Didier. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, interface, <laughs> the interface will show you a little bit of a different experience, yeah. uh, which might lead you to conclude that with an off-host proxy, recovery checkpoints are not used. But I found out that they are. And we might have a look at that later. Okay. If, if, if you remember what we talked about, how VSS uh, works with anything before 2016, I was talking about that in until 2012, you had the uh, VHDX that had to be mounted to the host system to be reverted to the VSS, the, yeah. the application consistent state. In 2012, that was actually the VHDX that was mounted on the, on the guest itself which is why you need a SCSI controller to, do, to be able to do that live, otherwise you can't back up. Uh, but that meant that in the past on the host or with 2012 R2 in the guests, you would see the, those, those event logs associated with surprise disk removals. 
which is yeah, always funny. Because, yeah, you're right. I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's that's always funny because I had I have I've had this many times in my career that people still to me. I think we have a problem on the VMs. There's discs being removed and and they're yeah. is, is and it's when is it? Oh, it's at three a.m. Always. Uh, yes, it's backups. <laughs> okay, so that's that's what you see happening now with the recovery checkpoints. As we discussed, this doesn't happen anymore. Right, so those event logs in the two VMs that are in this job will be missing. It is not happening. If you look at the the, the Hyper V uh, uh, backups here with the off host proxy, it's exactly the same. The recovery checkpoints that are being taken are uh, not being mounted to the guest. And when you create the host VSS, it's on, on, only a method of transporting or safekeeping those uh, recovery checkpoints for backup, right? If you transport it, you're gonna copy the data off to the top backup target. If you keep them around on the SAN, it's integrated with the SAN, and that's where you keep them. That's what we talked about. Mm -hmm. So this also leveraged the off-host proxy. Now, you will see something funny. With some SANs, you will see that if you use transportable snapshots, they, uh, they uh, are not leveraging the recovery, uh, are not leveraging, let's say, uh, the old way. So it's all recovery checkpoints. If you use sometimes the integrated backup software with a SAN, it works for 2016, but it's not smart enough. It actually mounts the, the VHDXs, even if it doesn't need to, and it dismounts them. It's totally total waste of time. Okay. So, but Veeam is smart. Veeam can leverage the hardware VSS provider, and not do that. But if you use another backup program, maybe of the software vendor or one that isn't that works with 2016, but isn't really that smart, sometimes they still work via the old ways, even if they don't need to, which is a bit silly, but it happens. Yeah. Uh, so let's kick this one off. So the process will be a bit different. Of course, it will detect uh, a couple of VMs to back up. And that's until now the same story. Let's again keep looking over here. We'll switch a bit between them. So it's preparing to create a snapshot. So just keep watching this window. Good things will happen to those who pay attention. <laughs> so there we have our guest interaction proxy again. It's inventorying the guest system. Things are happening here. Now you might say, hey, one, one is moving ahead and the other one is actually doing nothing. Well, it's not exactly true. What we are doing here with Veeam is we are using the option to use to create multiple backups from different VMs with one hardware snapshot. Mm -hmm. So it will show you the progress of that hardware snapshot process on one of the VMs and the other one will just be waiting around until it's finished. So things are going as expected. Now we see uh -huh. the snapshot, yeah. There we have our recovery checkpoint. And once this is taken, you know, we said then it will talk to the, the host. And the host now is creating that hardware VSS snapshot. Because that snapshot from the SAN will be mounted to our backup repository to copy off the data. But this still leverages the, the, the recovery type checkpoint. Right? It just is a different uh, experience in the user interface when you follow the you follow the process. Yeah. So once the snapshot is taken, and I don't know if there's many people here who used to play with uh, hardware VSS providers, but this used to be at least uh, three minutes, two and a half minutes at best, three, and a, three minutes, three and a half, sometimes four to five minutes. Look at this. The, the recovery checkpoints are very fast. The hardware checkpoint is just only doing a checkpoint for the purpose of having something to, to keep around or to mount somewhere else. It's now importing that snapshot on the off-host proxy that will back up, uh, will copy the data from that snapshot to the backup target, which are separate disks, nothing to do with the SAM. 
And uh, now the process is exactly the same as before. You will see that uh, the VHDX will be copied, the, the configuration files will be copied, as you would expect from a backup. Right? Mm -hmm. So you said there will be HAVHDX files of the different Yo, configurations? Let's, let's, go, let's go have a look. Yeah. Uh, was... let's, let's go to the correct VM, that might help as well. Yeah. Uh, and where is my storage? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. This is not in here. No. Yes. It's already. That's five. Okay. Yeah, let me see. My disks are somewhere else on this one. Might be on the other disk. Could it? Could it? Yay. Okay, it's already done, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We can run it. We can run it again. We can run it again. That's not a big problem. This this feels if it took a little bit longer than the other backup, or? Yes, yes, and the reason for that is quite easy. Uh, uh, you have to create the, the hardware via that snapshot, which doesn't take too long. But then, of course, that snapshot has to be mounted to your backup repository yeah. host, which takes another 21 seconds. So that's already 42 seconds longer, right? Now, uh, the benefit of this is that you are not copying data over your network. Right? Yeah. You are just leveraging your, your fabric, your storage fabric, whether it's iSCSI or FC, to do the copying. And it's on the same host as uh, the backup repository. Uh, if you mount it on, if, if your off host proxy is your backup repository, it's local disks. Right? So, so there's nothing going over the wire. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's the that's the the benefit there. So especially for environments that have, like say, uh, one gigabit networking for the for the node for the cluster network, uh, and that can't leverage a ten gigabit or better network that's also leveraged for CSVs or live migration for backups. This is a good option. So that's, true, that's something. Yeah. That's something you just have to re re remember about uh, backups and, and, and offerings uh, in backups. Backup software tends to have a lot of options. And you are not supposed to want to try and use every single option in the box. No, those options are there to create the best possible backup solution for your environment and your needs that gives you the flexibility. If you start trying to combine everything to say, look, I've paid for this product, I've got 27 options and I want to use them all because otherwise I feel like I paid for something I'm never using, that's kind of the wrong way of approaching a backup. Right? <laughs> you just create what you need. And for some environments, this works very, very well. Uh, so this is basically it. And as you can see, the, the source was a bit less uh, hammered in this case, but mm -hmm. it's uh, it's still not bad. It's five minutes. And if this was if this was a snapshot that isn't transportable and has to copy off the data to an, uh, to the backup uh, storage, but was integrated with the sand snapshot, basically the moment you have taken that snapshot, your backup can finish because it's going to keep that snapshot around on the sand for a predetermined amount of time. And that's it, there is nothing to copy off. But yeah. we've discussed this as well uh, last time, is that that's very nice to create a lot of backups in a short time range uh, and keep them around for a short period of time because that gives you very fast backups, meaning very short uh, recovery time object objectives and, and very short recovery point objectives because you, you, you cut out all the copying of the data. It remains on a snapshot yeah. on the sand. But the danger is, of course, if your sand crashes and becomes corrupt, you and might also lose, those, you lose all those snapshots. Yeah. So that three, two, one rule is very important. Even if you do that, you still might want to copy off those backups to uh, another type of, of storage or create a different type of backup. Uh, just don't, it, it, it's very easy. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Options are good. Yeah. They have a saying when it comes to redundancy, one is none and two is one. So if you want to have two options always, you actually need three options because you're just thinking one option might fail. So don't bank on it. 
and that's the idea with backups as well. Uh, we can always kick this one off again and make sure that we let me yeah let me just verify something here. That was three and four. So where are three and four living? Then we can get to the disk. It's volume two. So let's open volume two and be prepared this time, right? Uh, there we go. Okay. So. Kick it off. And keep an eye on it all. Yep. Mm. There we go. Trying to see everything here and now try to get this into the picture somehow so we can keep an eye on the checkpoint. Put it up a bit. That should about do it, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So where are we at? Any time now. There they are. There they are. Here we go. And basically that's it. The recovery checkpoint is being created. It's already done. You can, as you can see, it's very fast because basically these VMs are doing nothing. It could take it a bit longer, of course. This was a very I/O intensive SQL server. Yeah. But uh, but uh, the checkpoint is there. The the AVGXs are here. So now what this uh, job has to do is leverage what is in here natively and copy it off to the backup target. And once that is done, this will be cleaned up. The checkpoint will be deleted. So these will be gone. And then you're back here. And those, what, what's happened here that we've also discussed this is that these uh, checkpoints are removed, but the, the reference points in the change block tracking stays around. So this is leveraged to, to, with the change block tracking. And the good thing about the change block tracking being native to, oh, it's gone. It's gone, yeah. And it's now just finishing the backup job. Now, the good news about that change block tracking being native to Windows is that uh, it's one single solution for every backup vendor. So it makes life easier for Microsoft to say to a backup vendor, look, we created a new version of Windows, like Windows Server 2019 is coming. Instead of all those backup vendors having to re-evaluate re their code make sure it's compliant with 2019, make sure that they have their change block tracking correct, adapt code, test it because it's kernel level code. You know, it's, it's kind of tricky, it's kind of hard. Some backup vendors never did it. Uh, now they can just leverage what Microsoft gives them. There's of, of course one caveat over there. There's one big rule that Microsoft needs to respect. You do this right. Because if you have a bug here, yeah. uh, you are creating a bug for the entire backup industry. Whilst if it was change block tracking from one vendor that had an issue, well, that one vendor has an issue. Now all vendors potentially have an issue. So this is, this, this is an area where quality assurance and, uh, let's say, attention to detail is of extreme importance. Yeah. There, and, and, there and, is, and, uh, you know, uh, Gostev uh, from Veeam is uh, writing uh, a weekly forum post, or and uh, yeah. if they find something in the... Vendors uh, software like in Hyper-V or, or VMware, he's pushing it a lot, or he is really pointing it out and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. challenging but it, but it, the vendors. So that's but very, it is important. It is very important because a lot of these bugs tend to go unnoticed. Yeah, exactly. So if it's a bug that prevents you of creating a backup, you know. There's a problem, there's something wrong, we can't back up, we need to deal with this, we have to roll back an update or whatever. But if, if your backups succeed, and uh, then it's restore time, and they all fail, and that 
seems to be related to a bug that has to do with extending your virtual disk to a different size or a bug that's related to change block tracking that basically your backup is unusable. That's a very bad time to find this out. Yeah. And then, then of course, you've touched on another subject. Backing up is great. It's paramount. You need to do it. But you also need to restore. Uh, perhaps your backup software has an option to do automatic uh, restore testing or not. But the, And I'm not saying you have to run through an entire restore of your entire organization. But at, at the minimum, what you need to do is to schedule or have the discipline to test restores regularly. Uh, just samples, but just have a feel and a, and, a, and, a, and a health check once in a while of your restores, at least to make sure that you, one, know how to restore because this this is this sounds silly but you know how many people never try restores mm, I know. it's like oh look it's all nice and green everything worked and then oh the vm is gone it's corrupt i need to restore it uh, where is the option to restore actually uh <laughs> this is it sounds ridiculous but it's really it's really the reason why you do the backup to do those restores when it is needed mm. and you put in some effort and you put in some time and you put in some uh, time for learning. You also put in some money to have the backup targets, to have the, the fabric to make sure that you can back up in time, but also restore within a certain amount of time. Uh, and that has a price. And that price to certain people will always seem too much, apparently because you don't use it. But it's a bit like a car insurance, right? Or, or like your, your house insurance. Of course, you don't want to use it every day. That would mean your house burns down every day. Yeah, no, you don't. So, so that's that. It's it's a discussion that you you need to have with people, and uh, it's not just about VMs. Uh, this is, of course, but uh, whether it's clouds, whether it's uh, uh, containers that are not stateless anymore, whether it's uh, PaaS, whether it's SaaS. Do you have the required uh, options to restore data as your business needs? I often compare this when going to Office 365. I've had this discussion. Until we went to Office 365, we could restore a single mail within 10 minutes for the manager who deleted it and needed it again while he was still on the phone. Right. If you don't have a third-party product with Office 365, uh, and he shift deleted that thing, uh, you can't help him to recover it that yeah. easily anymore. Yeah. So I'm not saying that that doesn't make Office 365 bad, because without third-party tooling, you couldn't do the same uh, experience with Exchange on-premises neither. But apparently, when technology changes, some people also seem to forget about, hey, we need to rethink our backup strategy and see if it still meets our expectations yeah. and requirements. Yeah. And so Some people think the cloud will solve everything. So my data is there, it's backup and everything. Yes, and, and the good news is that after cloud, something else will come that will fix everything that's wrong with the cloud. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's the nature of technology. Yeah. It keeps evolving. And whatever it is, you need to, you, you need to evolve all your assumptions with them. Right? Because at a given moment, when, when, when something changes in your environment, whether it is a storage solution or whether it is a deployment solution versus on-premises on cloud, it's an assumption that changes. And you can't, and you have to verify them. Trust, but verify. And yeah, don't, 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 don't be silly. Don't, don't shoot yourself in the foot. That's, uh, that's kind of bad. Yeah. Maybe anyway, that, this... Yeah, maybe these are great last words for our showcast, Didier, yeah? Yeah, and um, we're going to close, and just because we can, whilst we close up here, I'm going to kick off a physical backup with V. Ah. Just, just because we can. <laughs> we can now. Yeah, we can now. But we can now. I'm doing it just because I can. Yeah. Ah, and I like this uh, agent for Windows. I have it on my uh, personal notebook. By the way, this is a cluster that I'm backing up, so oh. that's pretty cool, right? It is. That actually works. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you see it? So can you say, see... Uh... Yeah, you can see it over here, right? You see demo lab and two nodes. Yeah. So, yeah it's, it's, it's just working. It's, it's getting there. So you are backing up two hardware nodes? Yeah. That's okay. it. That's cool. Well, it, it's going to figure out where the, where, the, where the volume lives on the cluster. It's, it's going to take care of that for you. It's quite intelligent. And it's not too expensive. 
That's anyway. not too expensive. No. No. And you just buy the number of uh, licenses you need. Right. That's basically the gist of it. And if you're wondering why it's creating a VSS snapshot here, well, we're not talking about VMs now. I'm, I'm backing up uh, cluster nodes with file shares. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm backing up a file share actually on a, a clustered high available file share. That's it. So it's a file server cluster actually. Yeah, it is. It's, okay, cool. It's a general purpose volume. There we go. It's it's almost done, right? And it's uh, definitely hosted on the uh, node B and not on node A, as you can see. <laughs> that this is where it happens. So it figures out where what lives and does what is necessary. It's pretty cool. That's cool, yeah. Pretty okay. Cool. Uh, this was a nice demonstration of uh, the new backup capabilities in Windows Server 2016. I might I might have to make a little point here. If you still can, you can still register for the CDC, right? Yeah, you can. We are so if you're lucky enough, there is a pre-conf event, and I will be <laughs> talking about backups. And you can nag me with all your burning backup questions. I'll be around. If you dare talk to me, I, I don't eat people. I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm very nice in in real life. I'm very nice. Uh, you can you can ask me all your questions, and yeah. uh, if I maybe I can answer them. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so, so let's let's uh, clarify that a bit. We uh, the cloud and data center conference is happening uh, on the 15th and 16th of May. Uh, near Frankfurt in Hanau, and uh, as every year, we will have a pre-event. Um, the last year there was a Hyper-V community, and this is this year again. But we will also have the hybrid cloud community, and my friend Didier is talking about um, backup, and he is very approachable. Uh, sometimes he seems a little bit uh, grumpy, but he's not. I'm more grumpy than Didier. And if you have questions, come to the event. And of course, Didier is also speaking at the Cloud and Data Center conference about something that's dear to you. And you have done a fantastic uh, blog post series recently about... Uh, Please say it yourself. Yeah, uh, SMB Direct and RDMA, all the options you have there, when you should use them, how you should use them. And uh, it's actually version three of that talk. And in version one and version two, I used to be a bit more about uh, things to watch when you configure it, how to configure it. But now I'm talking more about the different types of RDMA you have, uh, the benefits, the strengths. Uh, I'm giving you more of a state of the union of the RDMA yeah. technology as we have it today, because that's becoming important. And it isn't as clear as, as it should be. It can be quite confusing to many people. And thinking about it before you buy anything could be interesting yeah. <laughs> in your benefits, you know. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's uh, often that way, actually. I'm looking forward to the talk. Um, I, I hope I can attend it. Maybe it's not possible because I'm the organizer of the conference and there's always something happening. Uh, but we will see. Yeah. So, I, I, can, I can always give it to you in private again. Yeah, that's so nice of you. So just um, for you. Yeah, CDC is uh, two and a half weeks away. Uh, when I uh, I will see when I, we get the video on so uh, on on the air. So maybe two weeks to go, and uh, it's a conference happening in Germany. We have a lot of German speakers, but we have also some international rock stars there, like my friend Didier or Aiden Finn is speaking, uh, Thomas Maurer, he's from Switzerland, he is able to speak German, but he prefers to speak English. <laughs> so he will, uh, Chambel uh, Nemnom. Charbel. Yeah. Uh, Charbel yeah, yeah. Nemnom, sorry, I always say Chambel, it's Charbel Nemnom. He is also coming, so we have some, some really great. How, how is his Swiss coming along? I don't know. I don't really know if he is able to talk <laughs> Swiss. <laughs> it's kind of German, so maybe it's uh, too hard. Yeah. Yeah. Is, so, is, is Bernard Trish is going to be there, I guess. Oh, you can open the website if you want to. No, no, no let's let's uh, try. Yeah, and do you that. can do that. We have uh, a, a amazing speaker alignment this year. Thirty MVPs are talking, and even three X MVPs. Yes, and the URL is very uh, easy. It's uh, cdc-germany-de. And there we go. Let's scroll down a bit. 
And we have some feature speakers there. Even uh, Didier is there. It's he is here. Oh, he yeah, has yeah. his thinker pose. Or what would you pose. call it? This is this 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 is a picture of me staring at the Grand Canyon for the very first time in my life. <laughs> so, uh, how did you take this selfie? I didn't take the selfie. It was Sorry. taken for me. <laughs> That's so nice. So if you scroll a little bit down, there will be a, a button all speakers. Oh, this is only that. a selection of speakers. So we have uh, we have Didier uh, uh, there. I, I'm there. Um, Daryl, Daniel Neumann, da Damien Flynn. I mean, Damien Flynn. Uh, Frank, Frank, Frank Bernard is there. Yes. We have Eric, Eric, Eric Berg, Frank. Yeah. Frank. yeah, Florian. You know him, maybe. Yeah. Of course, you know him. Uh, uh, Helmut, oh, always great. Helmut, yes. It, I love to chat with Helmut. You do the same. Jan is there. Um, and uh, even so, click this uh, this newsletter thingy away. Even my my wife has a talk, and uh, that's very interesting. She's talking about ebooks, <laughs> but this ah. this is a, this is a not so IT focused tema. But, but this is there. this is a this is a very interesting lineup. I mean, this is the the who is who in IT. It is. It I is. mean. Tudor, I mean, is oh, another, Tudor, Tudor, oh. Another uh, um, uh, Hyper-V MVP, and Thomas, of course. And, so, and, and, and the free thinker, I mean, he thinks out of the box. He's he's good, he's great. Uh, I mean, this is, this, there is not one single bad speaker here. These are all people that really work with the the, the technology yeah. and that have real life experience. It's not a, It's not a marketing event. No, it is really something to help you understand technologies better, share experiences. Uh, I call it the boutique conference. Yeah, it's and not even, as it's not as big as Ignite or other big vendor conferences, but this is real life stuff, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, that's that's nice. Yeah, and we have six tracks, so you. Um, I would have difficulties to choose the right talk for me <laughs> at any yeah. time. So if you click on the agenda. Um, uh, Agenda. Here we go. Uh, yes, uh, and it's a little bit hard to do. So you have the tracks here. This is track one, and then you can go through the tracks. I can try to click here. Is it okay. working? Yes, yeah. it is. And you have six tracks, and then we have another day on Wednesday where we have also a nice speaker lineup. So uh, look at the agenda. I love it. Uh, of course, I love it. I I have decided who is who is speaking when, uh, and it's it's very hard to um, to choose the talks. I would say. Uh, and yeah. uh, this year we unfortunately are not able to record the sessions because it's too much, too much sessions. Um, we will try to do that next year again, but this year you have really to attend the, the conference to benefit from the great uh, program. Yeah. Okay, you look at this. Okay, but but now let's uh, finish up the talk. There was your yep. session, SMB Direct, the secret decoder ring. There is this, another... This some guy trying to convince me to sign up for something. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we are. <laughs> okay, Didier. Uh, let's finish up. This was our, I think, 15th uh, Hyper-V Amigo showcast. We are rethinking the name, maybe, right? Uh, because yeah, we yeah. are not only talking about Hyper-V anymore. No, that was a joke. We will, be the, we will be forever the Hyper-V Amigos, even if, if there is no Hyper-V anymore. If because, only... be, be, because there is something to say about tradition, right? Tradition yes. is keeping things that were useful 200 years ago uh, just for the sake of having them around and having some sense of history. Yes. So even, even when we retire and Hyper-V might no longer be a thing, We'll still be the Hyper V Amigos. Yeah, we will. Uh, so, um, and we promise we will do uh, the Hyper V Amigo showcast a little bit more frequent, because uh, I I love that uh, that format. But the problem is, it's also busy. Uh, most of the time, it's it's my problem. Didier has uh, has. It seems more time than Care, me. Caref careful, careful, uh, careful, careful there. there. Careful. <laughs> but you know, of course, uh, of course, organizing I have... a conference. <laughs> Yeah, it's... I don't have employees to run after. That's that's also a benefit. Yeah. Uh, so that 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 helps. Uh, on the on the other hand, to me, it's busy for everybody. It that's, is. That's, it that's is. A given. Uh, so this is all free time spent. I I yeah. left work early today to do this. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good thing I have overtime. 
So we do, yeah, we do the community stuff. I think it is great and the technology lives from that, but it's sometimes hard if you have a busy job like you and me. And, uh, and, yeah, and, and, and sometimes you have to do something else, like at least go to the dentist or take a break yeah. and go, go for a hike and, and walk a bit, take a holiday. Yeah. Once in a while, you know, it's not like we're robots, not yet. We don't no. have AI implanted to help us with all that. But it will so, but then the Hyper-V bot is maybe coming. So, Didier, okay, let's finish up now. Uh, I, I lo I'm I looking forward to see you in person again in two and a half weeks. Or, okay, uh, it's, cool. Uh, yeah, two and a half weeks. And we will have a great time in Hanau. Uh, three days uh, full of uh, networking, talking, and I love it. So, see you soon, my friend. Bye-bye.